All right. For those that showed up, welcome to week 12. Um, as I said last week, I'm going to be actually covering basically two weeks worth of slides in one go because it's a topic. They're basically just the same topic stretched over and uh, it'll give you everything you need to do the last lab. Therefore, might as well just get her done. Um, there will be a little demo today, um, specifically about the functions part of this. Um, and the plan for next week is the final exam info and a more comprehensive demo on the second half of the con content for this week. And now this isn't working. Okay, so the first part of today's lecture is I'm going to talk about stored procedures and functions. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about them in relation to MySQL, also MariaDB, because it's pretty much the same thing. Um, and I'm going to explain the difference between functions and stored procedures, because there is actually a difference between them. Uh, but I'm actually going to start with stored procedures first. So, stored procedures in MySQL. A stored procedure contains a sequence of commands uh, that is actually stored in the database so that it can be invoked later by a program. Um, they're pre-compiled. So you create the code, MySQL interprets it, pre-compiles it, stores the, basically the byte code in the database itself. So later on, when you want to run it, it just runs it. It operates like a script. So you write a Python script, it starts at the top, it runs through, exits at the bottom, it does a bunch of things. That's what a stored procedure is. They don't return values. So you guys all know what a function is. A function in insert your preferred language here, whether it's Python, Java, whatever, is you call a function, it returns a value or an array or something. A stored procedure does not return um, a value. It just runs and basically gives you an exit code. So it can include pretty much any SQL statement, insert, update, delete. Um, however, it does have input output parameters. So input parameters obviously is things you feed in. Output parameters is what gets fed back out. So instead of returning a value, it can return a series of uh, parameters as when it's called. So you, you call it with a series of parameters fed into it, and it can actually return values through those parameters. Um, so for example, in Python or PHP, because they both behave pretty much the same, when you call a function, the function returns a value at the end, right? Now, I know in PHP, and I'm assuming you can do this in Python, you can pass a variable by something called by reference. So you don't pass a value in, you're actually passing in a pointer to the variable so that if the function itself can modify the values of the variable outside of itself, outside of scope. Um, this is basically what this does. It can call functions. It supports transactions. So you can start a transaction inside the store procedure, do a bunch of things, commit the transaction or roll back the transaction. And it can't be used in a join clause because, well, it's a store procedure. It's not part of a select statement. All right, so, you know what? I'm gonna, this shows you the syntax, kind of how it works. Um, it's create procedure, you give it a name, uh, you feed it the parameter specs, n number of parameters. Uh, you do a begin, it executes code, there's end. Um, there's actually examples in the slides, which is why I was just going to skip this. Uh, the parameter spec is in the form of in, out, or in, out. So in means value comes in and it doesn't leave. Out means whatever parameter gets called. So let's say you got a, it's called and you got parameter one, parameter two, Parameter three, all right? This one is set as an in, this one is set as out, this one is set as in, out. All right, parameter one, the value goes into it. Parameter two, it's actually gonna be null coming in, but when they ex it executes somewhere in the code, it can set the value of two, and it's gonna get passed out. 
In out means value comes in, you can actually change it. And when the procedure ends, whatever was fed into this spot is actually changed. So you can feed uh, variables or whatever you want into this and it will be passed along. Uh, by the way, this in out one is the equivalent of a PHP by reference call. And in Python, I think it's also, you can do reference when you call the function as opposed to passing in just a value, you can pass a reference. Um, so out mode means you can feed the stuff outbound. All right, so we have a small example. We have two tables, one is employee, one is department. You can see it has some basic values in there. You got IDs, names, salaries, and departments. So if we wanna keep track of the total salaries for employees working in each department, and we don't wanna run a select statement every single time, yes, five employees with select statement would be faster than writing this query any day of the week, but, not writing this procedure, but let's say we got thousands upon thousands of employees or, you know, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands like the Canadian government. You probably want to optimize that. So for this example, we'll create another table. It's called department salary or depth sal. And you'll have the department number and the total salary in there. So what we need to do is write a procedure to update this other table. So the first thing about MySQL that is very special, and almost none of the other databases do this, is you have to tell MySQL to start ignoring semicolons. Because in MySQL, what does semicolon mean? End of statement, just like in Java, semicolon means end of command. <clears throat> Good news, Python people don't have that problem, but you know it's a different issue for them. So we have to tell it to, start, to ignore semicolons. And I'll explain to you that why in a second. The command to ch tell it to change the basically end of command is called delimiter. So right now, if you do select star from table semicolon, the delimiter is the semicolon. It delimits each command that's gonna be run. However, we have to tell it, don't pay attention to the semicolon because we need to actually tell it to respect the semicolons inside the code. I'm gonna actually zoom into that in a second after I read the, the other stuff. So we're gonna define a procedure called update salary. It takes um, an input as a department number. The body of the procedure is an, an SQL command that's actually gonna update uh, the appropriate um, row. And then we we terminate it. So let's go and zoom into that a little bit. I zoomed in too much. There we go. Okay. So you can see at the top, I said delimiter double slash. So at that point, I'm telling MySQL, until further notice, ignore semicolons. Double slash is now your end of command. You know, replacing semicolon with double forward slash. Then we do create procedure that looks like create table, create user, create view, whatever. You give it a name. So it's called update salary. We have a single parameter. It's an inbound parameter. It's called param1 and it's an integer. I mean, this pretty much looks like a function definition in most programming languages. What is different though is the begin and the end. In JavaScript, this would be the opening curly and the closing curly. So we do begin, we write our code inside after the begin, and you'll notice there's semicolons in there. The reason why we got, we told it to ignore the semicolons is if we have multiple commands, it's gonna, it's gonna literally stop creating the procedure at the first semicolon because it goes, hey, it's the end of the command. And then we, you can see right here, it's update department salary, set the total salary, and there is a sub select in here, right? A sub query, Pad using the parameter one, where the department number is equal to parameter one. So essentially, if we feed in the number one, it'll substitute one here and here. And two double slashes, it will then create the stored procedure because it now knows the double slashes are the thing. We have to change the delimiter back to a semicolon at this point so that we can continue operating as usual. 
And this is the complete process. So set the delimiter to anything. Uh, you just want to make sure it's something that's not a, a normally recognized character in SQL, which is why double slash is good. Uh, double dollar sign is also very popular. Um, can't use pound. Why? Pounds are comments. Can't use slash star. That's a comment. Don't use dashes. That means minus, right? So you want to pick stuff uh, that's non-standard. Um, I've seen people use double pipe. You know, the that's the character above the enter key because that's something you don't see in SQL unless you're working with Postgres. Because Postgres uses that as its concatenation operator. And Python, it's the plus. String one plus string two. And Postgres, it's what it uses. Then we have a procedure and we reset the delimiter. So then we can call it. You notice this isn't select, it's call, which is why you can't use it in a join. Because joins are used in a select statement. Call is literally executes the function. Um, and then you do one, two, three, and it will update the appropriate table. We'd end up with something that looks like this. And that's the results of that function or that store procedure. Um, there is a way to see the status of the procedures, which is show procedure status. So it shows you all the procedures that are defined. Um, you'll see it has a bunch of stuff in there that you didn't define when you created the function. Um, other than having a name, it has, you know, a definer, which could be uh, the person who created it. So it could be root, could be whatever your user is. Uh, it has some dates on there. Um, it's got some security uh, type. It's got comments, character sets, um, you know, collation, which basically just determines how data gets sorted. Um, and if you want to get rid of a store procedure, it's drop procedure, whatever it's called, and the procedure just goes away. And it goes away really, really fast because it doesn't actually modify any data. It's deleting a single row out of a table that doesn't have a lot of rows in it under the best circumstances. All right, so you can declare stored in store procedures, you can declare variables. You can do flow control statements. So if then else, there's else if also, uh, there's loops, although they're a little different from what you're used to seeing in most programming languages. Uh, we have while and repeat. Um, now, what's really powerful though about this and all databases that support store procedures, functions, and triggers supports the concept of cursors. A cursor is used to iterate through a set of rows. That's what the next example is going to be. Um, there's a link in the slide, so you can go to MySQL tutorial. Notice I'm not sending you to the MySQL documentation site. I'm pointing you at a tutorial site. Why? Because the MySQL documentation for this stuff is horrifyingly bad. Um, the, it's hundreds of pages of syntax examples, not actual examples, syntax documentation. MySQL tutorial shows you really nice ways of doing it. So, all right. So to assuming we're going to redo the exact same example, we'd reset our depth table to zero. Uh, the previous procedure updates one row at a time based on the input parameter. Suppose we want to update all the rows at once, which makes more sense, right? So this is significantly longer now. And I'm going to explain to you a few interesting little things about this. Um, we changed the delimiter to double dollar signs instead of, you know, whatever we had last time. We'll drop the procedure just in case it exists, because as you're testing, you'll want to recreate this multiple times. And we start with create procedure, update salary. Notice our parameter is now gone because we're going to affect all the rows. We have our begin block. Fantastic. Now we're going to declare some variables. We are going to declare a variable called done. It's an integer. It defaults to zero. 
Why is it an integer? Because MySQL doesn't have Booleans. Therefore, what do you use if you don't have a Boolean? You use an integer. Zero means it's not done. One means it's done. We're going to declare the current department number as an integer, which so far just looks like normal variable declarations. Just, you know, the syntax is different from what you guys have seen, but the concept's exactly the same. You're going to declare, this is the one that's different. Declare denum cursor, so department number cursor, as a cursor. So that's the type of variable it is. It's a cursor for, and then you'll notice there's a select statement. Select department number from department salary. So when you define a cursor, a cursor is basically a pointer to an SQL statement. You declare it in the sense that you're going to say, hey, this cursor, when you open the cursor, you're going to run this SQL statement. And then, you know, stuff happens. But this is where MySQL is extra special. Um, every other database server I've worked with, and so far it's been about six total, and out of those six MySQL is the only one that has to do this. You'll notice I'm declaring something called declare continue handler for not found, set done equal to one. So essentially, you loop through the rows. When it runs out of rows, it goes, record not found. At this point, normally the procedure function or trigger would blow up and die. On the other hand, what this is doing is saying, hey, we're creating an error handler. So try catch fail. When it fails, set the variable done to one. It's a, such a stupid way of doing it. Um, other like other databases like Postgres and Oracle, you can just do literally while fetch the row. There's basically like a for each. You guys might understand for eaches or while true, make something happen. This one here, you actually have to put a handler saying, hey, when you run out of rows, don't crash. Please don't crash. Instead, set this variable equal to one to say that we're actually finished. It's just cursors in MySQL. It's I'm, I'm making fun of MySQL, because, and, but other database servers have their own little quirks. Like they all have their things, especially when it comes to these internal languages, because every database server does it differently. MySQL and MariaDB are pretty much the same. Microsoft SQL Server is really odd. It does its own thing because it has two languages. Oracle has one language, it does it okay, but it has its own little series of things. Postgres, on the other hand, has 14 different languages you can write this with. So pick your language of choice and they all act differently. So, but MySQL gives you one language and it's a little broken. So we've put in our handler to handle the fact that it's gonna fail. Then we open the cursor, open denum cursor. This is the equivalent of in a regular program where you execute an SQL query and you, you assign it to a result. Um, don't know what it looks like in Python. Um, because I think it's probably been about five years since I've written this in Python, so it's completely gone out of my brain. But in PHP, it would look something something like that. Actually, no, it's not execute, it's query. Execute is something else. Okay, so that's even for people that don't know Python, I mean, at PHP, that's pretty obvious what that's doing. It executes the query, whatever the variable is, and it assigns it to a variable. In this case, when you open denum cursor, it literally runs, select denum from department sal, and says, okay, the query ran successfully. From here on out, we have an open pipe to the database called denum cursor. Then we have repeat. No, it's not a while loop. It's not a for loop. It's called repeat. This is a uh, do while, essentially, for to map it out to you know, other language constructs you might recognize. Repeat, 
So we go fetch dnum cursor into current dnum. So what this is doing is it's saying, hey, grab the first row. And you'll notice right here that we have D number being passed in from that select statement. So column one gets passed into parameter one. So D number from this query goes into current D num. Then we go update department salary, set the total salary equal to the sum of the salary for employee where D number is equal to this, where D number is equal to current D num. This is the same thing as we had before with param one. But instead of what we're doing is we're saying, hey, go ask the database what the next one is. This finishes, it hits until done, because zero means it's not done. It'll loop back up here, fetch the next one, update the row, check to see if it's done, grab the next one, update that one, because we know there's three. It'll loop, it'll go fetch DNUM. Oh, wait, there's nothing left. The error kicks off, sets done equal to one, and then it says, oh, the loop is now complete. Congratulations. Uh, this would be the equivalent of, um, in most languages, if I were going to do it as a pseudocode, it'd be uh, while not done, do something. And eventually in here, you know, you have uh, done equals true, and then it breaks out of the loop. It's the same idea. It's just written really stupid. Um, and then we close the cursor because we should always be good little citizens and make sure we close off our resources before you exit the, exit the procedure. Not everything has a really good garbage collection. Uh, MySQL used to have memory leaks where if you didn't leave your cursors, they just stayed alive in memory even though nothing was using them anymore. Um, that's been fixed, but who knows what else is wrong with MySQL. So we're just going to say, hey, Let's just clean up after ourselves and close our cursor. That means it releases the, the access to that table. It hits end, and then we reset the delimiter, and away we go. So now, before we run the procedure, we go select star from depth sal. We know we're at zeros. Now we just call update salary. You'll notice there's no parentheses, and it's now updated. That function will loop through each of the departments and basically summarize the data from elsewhere. This has the advantage of if for people that are doing data analytics or uh, heavy duty reporting with large data sets, you could set this to run once at night, at midnight, once a day, and summarize a bunch of data into some pre pre canned tables, so that the reports run faster without affecting day to day transactions. Um, now, what's really advantageous to this is that it's the code is pre compiled. MySQL doesn't need to think about whether or not it can execute it because the first time you create it, it double checks to make sure it can run and there's no weird syntax issues. The big problem though, is if the structure behind the scenes changes, the store procedure doesn't know it changed. So cache 22. So let's just say we're gonna create a procedure to give a raise to everybody. Here's what this looks like. This time we're changing the limiter to a pipe because, you know, we got to make sure we show you guys that yes, it can be pretty much anything you want it to be. And we create a procedure called give raise. We're going to have an inbound parameter called amount. It's a double because we're going to allow a percentage. We got our begin block and we're declaring five variables. We declare a good old done. Sounds familiar. To nothing. To zero, I mean. We're going to deploy and declare an employee ID, a salary. Then we're going to create a cursor that's going to select both an ID and the salary from the employee. And then we're going to declare a good old continue handler because MySQL is stupid and it doesn't know how to actually do a proper while loop. We open the employee record. So it's going to run the command select ID comma salary from employee. We repeat. And now you'll see that the fetch command feeds into two separate variables. So fetch employee record into EID. So pull record number one. EI, the ID here goes into EID. The salary from here goes into the sal variable. So each column in the select statement will be mapped out to the same parameter in the same order. Yeah, that, that means you have to make sure of a few things. You have to make sure that the data type is the same. You have to make sure you have the same number of variables as columns being passed back. Um, 
at one point, MySQL let you have more columns coming back than you had variables. Then it stopped allowing that. Then it started allowing it. Just make sure it matches. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go imp update employee, set the salary equal to the salary plus, and we're going to round it, the salary times whatever amount's being passed in, where the ID is equal to the employee ID. So this uses a bunch of different pieces. We got the salary which is being pulled from this cursor, the amount being passed in as a parameter, and the employee ID being pulled in from this query, from this cursor also. It'll do this until done. It ends the repeat, ends the statement, and then we reset our delimiter back to a semicolon. And then we could go give raise, 10% raise to everybody and magically, it just goes up by 10% for everyone in a single command. Okay, so these are procedures. They're good for things like jobs you need to do, not real-time calculations. They're good for jobs you need to do. Database maintenance. Um, since MySQL doesn't have materialized views, you create. You might use a procedure to update all your materialized views once a day. Um, you might want to create one to make certain processes a little, you know, nicer to use. Uh, basically, but whatever you think you can do as an automated job, you can create procedures to do for you. All right, now to talk about functions. So MySQL comes with a bunch of predefined functions. You guys probably know most of them. Well, that's not true. You probably know some. Uh, you probably know about min, max, sum, you know, your good old aggregate functions. Um, there's string functions like upper, lower, you know, I'm sure you can guess what upper and lower do to strings. Um, yeah, there's functions for math. So you can do literal math functions like uh, averages and uh, uh, sines, uh, cosines, that kind of stuff. Um, there's all kinds of functions. However, every once in a while we'll need a function that is different than what MySQL offers, and you can make your own. So by creating additional functions, we can add capabilities to our database server. Functions are compiled at runtime. So every single time you call the function, it gets compiled. It's not pre-compiled. Functions must have a return type and can only ever return one value, as opposed to the store procedure that can take parameters in and parameters out. This can have as many parameters inbound as you want, but it can only ever return one value of a specific data type. That probably sounds a lot more familiar to the kinds of functions you guys are used to seeing in your other courses. And they're only supported in select statements. You can't call a function. You have to select it. Um, they cannot be used, you cannot create a transaction inside the function. You could use the function inside of a transaction, but you can't use a transaction inside the function. If that makes sense. Um, a function can't call a store procedure. Kind of stupid to try to do that. Uh, but you can use it in a join clause. <clears throat> so, Functions are declared using the following syntax, and there's actually a typo on this slide. It's create function, function name, returns a type. And I'm just gonna go and actually dive into a few, a bit of this. So I'd rather just show it to you with an actual declaration than that weird slide. So we're gonna change our delimiter. It's being changed to a pipe. Create function, give raise. So we're going back to, you know, essentially what we were looking at originally. Old value is a double, amount as a double, returns a double. You'll see this thing called right here called deterministic. Um, this is a MySQL thing. That can be two things, deterministic or uh, not deterministic. Deterministic means if you give it the same parameters, it will always output the same value. So for for those like for the math, let's say we're doing math, right? For the for that, if we say um, one hundred times point 
1, it's always going to be equal to 10, right? Yeah, that's right. No matter what, you run this a thousand times, it'll always be 10. 10% 10 of 100 is 10. Therefore, this would be a deterministic style function because if you feed it these two parameters, it'll always be equal to 10. So why would you want to tell the database server if it's deterministic or not deterministic? Can somebody take a guess why? If it's deterministic and the parameters are the same, it knows it doesn't need to actually do the function. It just returns the last thing it saw. It speeds up the functions. So if, well, for example, if we're running this against a, a bunch of people's salaries and the first employee has a salary of 100,000, next employee has 90,000, then we have another 100,000 and it's all running as part of a single call, because it saw 100,000 times 0 0.01, the first time it'll have to execute it. Then it'll execute this one, which would be equal to nine. But then it sees this again, and it's not even going to bother execute the function. It's going to say, hey, last time I saw this, this was the answer. I don't need to execute the code. Now, in this example, it's only one line of code. If it's a function that's got hundreds of lines of code, it will do a small performance boost because it doesn't need to execute it every single time. It's the same parameters. Great. Imagine if in Python, Java, PHP, whatever language you're working, if your compiler was smart enough to know that if you pass in these parameters, it's going to stay the same every single time. It doesn't even need to execute that code. You can just skip right over it and say, hey, last time I saw this, this is what it was. Congratulations. We don't need to do anything today. So that's what the deterministic, not deterministic thing does. You have to include it as when you define it. It is what it is. Um, and obviously not deterministic means always run the code. Then we do begin. In here there, we're going to declare a new variable called new val. That's a double. We're going to set the new value equal to the old value times whatever the math is. And we return the new value and reset our delimiter. So if we fed this one, like a 10% raise, it would come back as 110,000. All right. Actually, here's the explanation of the deterministic, non-deterministic. I pretty much explained it, so I'm going to skip the slide. So if we were to run this function, it goes select name, salary, give raise, salary, comma, 0 0.1, has new salary from employee. So basically, we created a function to calculate salaries. We could use this to update. We could use it to, you know, do inserts. We could use it for a bunch of things. But it's, you know, how you use it. All right. So what's the difference between a function and a stored procedure? A function is compiled at runtime. A stored procedure is pre-compiled. That means it runs faster. Realistically, if they only have three lines of code, they're both going to run at the same speed, except the stored procedure doesn't need to double check if it can run or not because it, the database server assumes it's pre-compiled, therefore it will run. The function, it has to do a syntax check every time you call it. So it's like the difference between running an executable and running a script. You run an executable that's compiled, it just runs it. If you're running a script, the script interpreter will pre-read the entire file, make sure there's nothing broken in the code, and then execute it. Function only does select statements. Stored procedures basically supports everything. Um, it can only return, a function returns one value. A stored procedure doesn't return a value, but it can return multiple values via output parameters. Um, function only has inbound, procedures that in and out. A function operates like a method or a basically a function, take your pick of whatever language you want to talk about. Um, a stored procedure operates like a script, so um, did you guys learn about bash scripts yet in your networking, networking class? At some point you might learn about bash. Well, you guys know about Python scripts, same idea. Um, functions can be used in a join clause. Stores procedures cannot because they're called, they're not selected. Um, functions cannot have transactions inside of them. Uh, store procedures can have transactions inside of them. 
So normally you want to use store procedures whenever possible, uh, depending on what it is you're trying to do, uh, because they do way more things on the inside. They're transaction safe, uh, more flexibility. Um, they also run a little bit faster. However, if it's a simple task, you don't expect to repeat on a regular basis, or it's something that really doesn't need to be a store procedure, a function is probably more use, suitable for it. All right. So let's go see how badly Dan can write a function. All right. So I'm going to use my credit union table. And I'm going to create a function. Oh, hang on. Gonna make it this. Let's go make sure I'm following the syntax properly. So delimiter this, and then I'm gonna go create function. Uh, and it's gonna be, uh, customer ID and it's an int. So I write functions so often that I cannot for the life of me remember the syntax most of the time. So you'll see me uh, returns uh, double um, not deterministic begin and end. Uh, data grip is really nice. You notice it actually knows that I changed the rules and it fixed it for me, which is always really nice when an ID does that for you. Uh, delimiter, put our delimiter back. All right, so just like in any language that supports block identifiers, whenever you open it, you close it right away so you don't forget to close it. Uh, JavaScript, you know, you open your curly and you close your curly right away. Otherwise, you don't want to have to figure out why your things are broken because you lost a curly along the way. All right, so now what we're gonna do is um, declare balance as a double. And we are going to go uh, select some of balance from accounts where uh, customer ID is equal to customer ID. All right. And this is probably going to cause me problems, but yes, it is. Let's go change this to, uh, should try to avoid uh, doing that. Okay. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert this into balance. All right, so I'm declaring a variable. I'm in, I'm selecting this value, but I'm going to insert it into that variable. And then I'm going to return that. And I, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. I haven't done this in a while. So as I was walking to class today, I was think, trying to think of what I could do for a good example for this. So I've never actually written this function before. So who knows if it's actually going to work. Um, I'm one to admit that uh, I may have issues. All right, I'm gonna hit run. You'll notice that you want to run the whole thing as a block. If you just run the one, if you do like run this statement, the next time you run it, it's not gonna know that you changed the delimiter. So you have to run the whole thing as a, as a single thing. So I'm gonna go run and it blew up, uh, has none of the deterministic What the heck is that? Great. Binary logging menu is less safe. Nah, that's not what this is. This is MySQL 8. The less safe.
Thanks, this is read SQL data. Okay, let's grab this error message. There's nothing like doing examples in front of the class and it blows up. I'm doing the same thing you guys would do. One stack overflow. Um, because I'm connected as root, deterministic. Well, that's interesting. Okay, let's try this. Did that actually work? Yes. Okay. So apparently the new, my, the latest version of MySQL will have to tell it that you're not going to damage the database. Eh? No, I just need to tell it that it's going to read the SQL data, that it's not going to update anything. Whatever. So if I go in my other one here and I go select account so let's go select uh, name, comma. No, I don't have that. Let's go select account. Hang on. Customers over here. Columns. Yeah, okay. So select name, comma, account, balance, ID from customers. And I got an error message, and that should still work. Let's go try it. Uh, um, action done. Oh, because I'm connected to the wrong one. Oh, where did I create the? Ah, that's right. Okay, good. Let's go run this in the right place. And we're getting nulls. Amazing. So, and now we go debug. And um, there's a few ways we could do this. We can go um, that should actually work. Not deterministic, reads SQL data. Like I said, I haven't done this in a long time. So like last time I read a function was last semester and I actually just copy pasted it because I had one that worked. Um, Really? Oh, okay, we can do that. That works. Let's try it this instead. And let's see if this works. Nope, oh, still doesn't work. Do I actually have balances? Did I wreck my database earlier? No, nope, we have balances. Man, I hate it when I do demos and they don't work. This might go right. Yeah, it does. Do I really need the at sign?
select the sum of the balance. Okay, let's first things first, let's make sure my SQL statement actually works. Um, you know what? Hi, right, thank you. And what's worse? Um, somebody actually mentioned it right in here. You saw it there and I didn't catch it. So there you go. So we just learned something. Make sure your variables don't match out to any of the column names you're playing with. There, we all learned something, go team. Um, so this is a non-deterministic. Apparently we need to add a new security header that reads SQL data if you're gonna do a select statement inside of it. Uh, if it doesn't have a select statement, it probably will work without that little bit. Um, I actually have an example uh, from years ago. Okay, not in here. Nope, not there. Of course, I'm not going to find the old example I had. No, I, anyways, I had an example that does a random wild uh, dice roll um, that doesn't have this thing. But you know what I'm going to do first? I'm going to grab this. I'm going to go uh, file, save as to my desk to into here and into where's my one drive here this one gonquin 8250 summer and we're going to go here and we're going to call this um, function example dot sql okay I'll post the example for you guys. You have a working example that works with the database that you all have. Man, I hate doing demos. Yeah. Yeah, so functions are supposed to not be non-destructive. They're not supposed to, which is why we had to tell it it reads SQL data because we have to tell the database, you can trust this function because it's not going to hurt anything. There's things, there's settings you can change in the MySQL I and I to tell it, hey, functions are allowed to do this. Realistically, your functions should never, ever change the data. That's what procedures are for. Are you talking about a, a, a procedure to do it? Where, what do you mean? You're creating a new user? Yeah, you do an insert statement for that. Like if you're adding a single user, you'd use an insert statement. You wouldn't use a procedure uh, because the procedure, like I'm not sure what you're after exactly, but basically, but if you're adding like a new user, you just do an insert statement. Right. Uh, still trying to follow what you're saying, but essentially a store procedure, you can use it to do data maintenance. So you can do the insert update deletes inside of that. It's going to allow it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely.
Well, you'd have to call, you'd be still be connecting using an SQL connection of some sort, and you'd go call and you'd feed it the function, the, the procedure name and all its parameters. Yeah, you don't. You don't, you're not exposing the structure, but you're still exposing the fact that you're connected to it. Because you have to be connected to it to call to call the procedure, right? Um, well, the problem is that you normally wouldn't execute a select to S, a, an SQL statement from the command line. You'd connect to the database and then call it. Like, you'd open up a... So, you're talking about, let's say you want to create a script that runs every night at 1 a.m. Right? At that point, um, you'd have to craft... Um, you know how you do the restore when I was talking about backup and restores where you're reading it from a file? You'd literally have to create that file every night and then run the MySQL command reading the contents of that file and then delete that file when you're done. It's really, it's you're really making things more complicated than it needs to be <laughs> at that point. But yeah, you could. You'd create an SQL file, you put the commands call this, call this, call this with all the parameters defined. Then you'd execute the whole file as part of the call to MySQL. You wouldn't call the function as like sitting at the prompt then typing it in. There. Okay. So that's a function. It's a working function now. Uh, yay. Um, so that having been done, I'm going to dive into um, just make sure my battery's not dead. Getting close to the end of the semester. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to dive into the second half of today's topic, which is talking about triggers. Um, and I am actually, can I borrow, well, borrow, can somebody give me a piece of paper? I forgot to take a stupid piece of paper with me, just a page ripped out of a notebook. Actually, no, wait, wait. I don't need to borrow it from someone. Somebody forgot, lost their notes. At the start, of, it's, they've been here since the start of semester. Uh, whoever's taking uh, compilers and has really nice handwriting lost their entire notes. It's been here since week two. I don't know who it is. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'm, I just need a piece of paper for an example later to explain a few things about this topic. Okay, all right, triggers. Now, the reason I do the trigger lecture at the same time as the functions and store procedures is because triggers uses the same language. Since your brain's in the right place right now, let's dive into that topic. All right. Triggers are event-driven actions. Now, a lot of students that are first learning how to program don't really understand the concept of event-driven programming. So, small history lesson. Picture Dan. 19 years old, hard to picture, sitting in college, and a brand new language just came out. It didn't just come out, but it has now started becoming accepted. And the whole concept of it is that it's an event-driven language. Can anybody take a guess what the language that exploded onto the development scene in 1994 was? JavaScript didn't even, wasn't even close to existing yet. No. See, been around forever. Visual Basic. Okay. Everybody looks and I say Visual Basic now, and most people go, what the heck's that language? Okay. Visual Basic was an interesting language because the way it worked is you actually in the IDE, drew the forms, like the screens the person interacted with, and you could assign events. So they click into a, you guys have experienced this with HTML and JavaScript, hopefully, where you know how a field has a blur effect, where when you leave the field, it goes blur on focus, when the field gets focused, click. Well, JavaScript, I mean, Visual Basic had the same thing where you could click on a button, you could you know, focus on a field, lose focus on the field, the contents of the field changes, your drop down changes, all those events. That's called event driven programming in the sense that you could write code tied to specific events. 
That was the first time that anybody had that. It was the coolest thing ever because you could really write applications really, really quick because you didn't have to worry about all the code to draw the form. You didn't have to, the compiler took care of tying all the hooks in the right places. Over the years, that concept was brought to many other languages. Uh, Turbo Pascal showed up to the party about a, two years later. Uh, JavaScript suddenly was able to interact with web pages. Uh, Java had uh, uh, forms that you could do the same thing with or attach events using the IDE. Those are all events. So every single time you click on a field, you mouse over whatever, those are events. There's something firing off, which is why your browsers are such pigs now. Because it's constantly watching everything you're doing. Oh, did you move your cursor from left to right? Yes, we can make something happen if we want. Is the cursor at this location on the screen? Yes, we can make something happen if we want. Database servers have events. And they have, but instead of being concepts of clicks or right clicks, we call them moments. There are six moments that can be captured in most database servers. Some database servers actually have more, but any database server that supports triggers has six moments guaranteed that they support. We have before and or after an insert, update, or delete. So we can do an event before an insert, after an insert, before the update, after the delete, for example. Um, depending on the database server, the trigger may or may not play nicely with the transaction. Uh, MySQL, big hint, does not play nicely with transactions. Other database servers do. Oracle and Postgres handle this triggers inside of transactions very well. All right. So events that drive triggers. As soon as the command is executed, a listener ensures the trigger runs. So you type in an, an update statement and you run the update statement. Something in the database server takes a look at your update statement and says, hey, we're playing with this table. Are there any triggers? Yes. Okay, let's go run some triggers. So there's an event. An insert, update, or delete is an event. Let's go to see what we can do before and after the fact. So our six events are as follows. Before insert, before the data is inserted into the table. Sounds pretty obvious, but might not be. After insert, after the data has been inserted to the table. That means the transit, you no, know, it's actually successfully wrote it to the table. It can then execute this code. So before the update, after the update, before delete, after delete. So essentially you can, Make something happen before the command executes. The command executes. Hopefully it executes correctly because it can actually do the before trigger and still have the command fail. And then you have the after command, which means if the command successfully finished, do this also. So it's a post execution hook, essentially. Um, if those events don't occur, the trigger won't execute. If the event doesn't have a trigger, again, those triggers won't execute because they do not exist. Um, there are statements that execute these events behind the scenes. So for example, if you have, uh, you have an insert trigger and you run a replace or load data command, specifically MySQL, it'll fire off the insert trigger because you're doing a load data you're reading file, data from a file and it's inserting the rows into the table. So it's going to fire off the trigger for the insert, even though you didn't explicitly run an insert command. You have to be careful because sometimes you'll have triggers and then you execute something and it runs the trigger. So if, for example, you're doing a load data, you're loading a million rows. You have a before insert trigger. It's going to fire that trigger off a million times. There's overhead. Just, just in case you don't know what that means, that means not only is it going to write the data to the disk, it's going to run some code before it does it. And every time you do it, it makes things go a little slower because there's code executing. It's really fast most of the time, but it's still executing code. So 
I'm actually going to have a chart in a second. Uh, but there's the chart's going to be, I think, the next slide. There's two data structures that, however, that get created every single time you execute. Um, we have new and old. So we have uh, ins. We have the insert, updates, delete. Man, my handwriting's bad today. And my marker's dying. New, old. Okay. So, what new and old contains is the values being passed into the trigger. So, when we do an insert, we have the new values, obviously, because we're passing values as part of the insert statement. What do we not have? We don't have the old values because we're adding something new, therefore, there's nothing there before. Update has both. Update means you receive the values being passed in. That goes into the new object, which is looks just like a record. And it also has a copy of the old, which shows, well, basically what was there before the update fired. Delete only has the old because we're not putting anything new. We're just nuking what was there. So in our triggers, we have access to two data structures, new and old. And those allow us to do some data comparisons. I've got a complete story to go with this. So here's the flow chart. Um, it's really, really small. Actually, it's not too bad on that screen. Um, this is a simplification, just so you know. SQL command is received by the SQL interpreter. It checks, is this a manipulation command, also known as insert, update, or delete? No, it's not. It's a select statement. It just executes it and returns the results as applicable. Yes, it is. Is the command valid? As in, it checks to see if the command can actually be executed? Yes or no? No, it gives you the typical error message. Yes, the command is valid. So it's an actually a proper insert statement. At this point, it goes, okay, inside this insert statement, what table am I playing with? Oh, we're playing with customers, as the example. It goes, okay, on the customers table, is there a before trigger? Yes or no? Yes, there is. It executes the before trigger. No, it just executes the insert statement. Now, it executes the, tr the, the, the trigger. It checks, did it run right? Yes or no? If it doesn't, it blows up. Yes, it'll run the command. Then it goes, did the command work correctly? Yes or no? No, it blows up. Yes, it checks if there's an after trigger. It executes the after trigger. Did the trigger work? It outputs the results. End of story. Now, remember earlier when I snarked about MySQL not being nice with transactions? Here's something I discovered years ago uh, with MySQL, and it apparently still does it. So you guys remember the concept of a transaction, right? You begin a transaction. You insert, insert, update, insert, update. Until you hit that commit, it's only a single block of execution, right? And then you commit. Cool. MySQL. But it fires off the, we do our begin. We do a couple of inserts, okay? It does the <clears throat> before insert trigger for each one of those. Cool. Before insert fires off, great. The execute command works, great. That gets committed to the database. The after trigger actually generates an error. The after trigger fails. Okay, so we make it all the way to here. Now, do you remember the point of our transaction? If any part of it fails, the whole thing fails. In MySQL land, if the after trigger fails, guess what? The data is still in the database. At this point, it's been written to the disk. It couldn't give two shits whether or not the rest of it works. 
data is in the database, congratulations, after trigger blows up, I don't care, the data, the data is already there, which is bad. Um, because, well, you've modified the data, the after trigger that might be supposed to be doing some certain things, fails. Therefore, you might actually have be creating erroneous data or erroneous rules kind of thing. Now, that's the risk. Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, any part of it fails, the whole thing fails. Cool. So any part of any trigger fails as part of its process, fantastic, it fails. Um, you know, it is what it is. So advantages of triggers. They can be used to catch errors. That's a before insert. You can use it to clean up the data. You can make sure that things are correct. Uh, you can double check data in other places to make sure that the rules are being followed kind of thing. Um, theoretically, you could use it to schedule tasks. Um, in other words, you could get a trigger to call a procedure. A little dangerous, but you could do that. Um, it's really useful for keeping records of table changes so that they can be audited. And what my, my, my real world example has to do with that. Uh, you can also use it to do data integrity checks. In other words, um, as part of the trigger, you can check, make sure the data is valid, that you're not gonna break anything. Okay. All right. Disadvantages of triggers. Adds overhead because it runs all the time. It adds extra CPU cycles. It eats memory. It's invoked from actions on the client side. It may not provide all the information. All right. So you can see this slide only applies to MySQL. Triggers cannot execute the following statements. Show, load, load data, backup database, restore, flush, and return. They cannot be used in transactions or other statements that, compl that commit implicitly or explicitly. In other words, if there's a commit somewhere in there, the trigger might fail and still allow the commit to happen. Um, theoretically, you can't call a store procedure, but I've seen it done. Just don't do that. Other database servers actually have significantly more capabilities when it comes to triggers. Um, Basically, put, let's, for the next couple of examples, pretend I'm saying Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server instead of me having to say it every time. There's a trigger for the select statement. Select star from table. It can, you can have a select trigger, a before select, and it goes, instead of, you can say you're selecting from customer, you can actually have a trigger that tells it, no, 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 you're not gonna grab the data from here, you're actually gonna grab it from here instead. You can actually hide the table away from things which is really cool. Um, they have uh, DM, uh, DDL triggers. You can actually have, a, have before create table or after create table. So a table gets created, you can actually fire off a trigger after the database structure changes, potentially to log the changes, what made those changes. Um, MySQL doesn't do that stuff. That's okay because the number of times I've seen DDL triggers, in my 27 plus years, two times. I wrote both of them because I was trying to catch someone that was screwing around with the database structure. <laughs> Basically put, I had a before uh, alter command. And if it wasn't me doing it, I'd return an error message, <laughs> you know. All right, so the syntax for creating a trigger. And I will do a live example, but I'm actually going to do it next week because you guys' brains are going to start melting soon. Um, it's create trigger, trigger name. You define when and what you, on the table. And now, there's going to be a row here called for, there's a line here called for each row, and then you define the rest of the trigger. So the trigger name must be unique for per, it's per table in MySQL. So you can have the same trigger name in multiple places, but it's tied to each table. So it's like a column. Um, however, because MySQL keeps changing how things work, just make sure all your triggers have unique names. It's just safer that way. All right, so here's an example of a trigger for after update. And this example is really close to something I actually did in the real world. So. 
This looks familiar, right? We're changing our delimiter. Why? MySQL. You go create trigger, give it a name. After update, it means after the record has been successfully modified in the table. We are going to fire this trigger. That means that once it's committed to the disk, we are going to fire this trigger. On the table called products, for each row. Now, for the for each row clause is optional. What for each row does is if your update statement, in this case, modifies more than one row, it will fire the trigger for each row being modified. If you don't include the for each row, it's known as a global trigger where it fires off once for that update statement, whether it modifies one or a million rows. Honestly, every trigger I've ever seen written has for each row, just, just so you know. You know, it's I'm sure there's uses for the global version of it, but I've seen for each row. You begin. That also looks familiar. Now, you'll see if old serial number is not equal to the new serial number, then insert into product log. And then you can see what the columns I'm inserting. You'll see I'm inserting the old ID, the old name, the old serial number now, which is a function that, the term, that gives you now a timestamp, like, you know, July 25th at 3 p.m., and then a, a note. End if end. Okay. So now I'm going to use my example here for my piece of paper, but I needed it to explain this. When the new and the old, the, the what's important to know about that is whether or not it's happening before or after. Now, when it's a before trigger, the values in you can be changed. If it's an after trigger, the values in you cannot be changed. Why? Insert into users. Name is Dan. And we've decided Dan's never allowed to be inserted. So we could theoretically change the name to Bob. Before it's been written to the piece of paper, you can change it to whatever you want. So the new values coming in can be anything you want it to be. You can change it 25 times in your trigger. It makes no difference. So right now, in memory, the guy's name is Bob. Is Bob. But the second it gets written on the piece of paper, can we change it once it's written down? No, because it's permanent. While it's before, you can change the value in new. Once it's been committed to the disk, you can't change it anymore because it's in the disk. It becomes just a point of reference. That's something that people, when they start learning how to write triggers, have a hard time grasping. That new, is you can change it to whatever you want before it gets written to the disk. So in the before trigger, new can be modified. And then after trigger, new cannot. It's just how it is. Because once it's applied to the physical disk, it can never change ever again. Until the next time you run the command. But until then, that's that. Now, I'm going to give you guys an example of what triggers are really good for. Real world example, which is very close to this code. Um, so place I was working at, um, we had an online registration system that was pretty not well written. I'll admit it. I wrote it. I'll admit it, it wasn't well written at, at the time. It was well written, but it never it never was revisited to make it better. And um, I actually took a leave of absence from that job to go work somewhere else for a while, just to you know fresh up my skills. And I get a call one day going, "Hey Dan." Um, can we borrow you for like a couple of days? I go, sure. Uh, yeah, so the serial numbers for our products in the database are changing and nobody's doing it. I'm like, cool. What do you want me to do about that? Because I'm not working for you, right? Uh, me being who I am. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but we need to stop that. I'm like, okay. So what had happened 
is we had um, a person with nefarious intentions was using an anonymous proxy in the Netherlands to hit our server, and he created a bot. The bot was randomly feeding values into the post of the submit, and when you registered your product, it would transmit to you encrypted license files. Dude was trying to figure out how to decrypt our license files because he was feeding in known values into the form. He was trying to figure out what was inside the license file because if you feed in serial number one, two, three, four, it gives you a starting point to break somebody's encryption because that's how you break encryption is if you know there's a set value in the file, you can find the pattern that decrypts that and then from there you can figure out the keys. Never would have worked because of how we had the security set up, but he was screwing up people's data. So a three and a half year cat and mouse game between myself and this hacker started where I kept finding ways to stop him from doing it and he found new ways of doing the same thing. Joy, that's what happens when you got one guy trying to handle security. Um, so we banned the Netherlands um, for about four months until we figured out how to stop them, which was great because our data stopped changing. Um, and I created a table that would keep track of the serial numbers. And every time a serial number in the database would change, I would log the old number and the new number when it changed. And the back end in this case was Postgres. Postgres has a really cool function. As part of an insert statement, you can call a function and, it, and if it's part of a trigger, it can tell you this is the command that actually fired off this trigger. So I can grab the uh, insert or updates command that actually modified the record. So then I was, you know, turned on the Netherlands again. Dude starts up like 20 minutes later. I let We let him go for about an hour, turn off the Netherlands again. This went on and on and on. We, we only had like 14 customers in the Netherlands. So we, we basically emailed them saying, hey, we're, we shut off the Netherlands. Um, your laws are too loose. <laughs> and then I looked to the table log and I was able to identify the select the update statements. And then I went through the code and figured out where these commands were coming from. So then I could backtrace in ways to harden the code to not let them run these commands. Um, and at the same time, since I had the old serial number and the new serial number, I was able to basically undo all his changes every time he started. And the trigger looked almost identical to this. Slightly different structure, whereas, you know, where you have the uh, log type instead of that, it was the actual SQL command that executed it. Um, but yeah, years of cat and mouse games with this person. It took me about three and a half years to get to the point where he, I was able to stop him completely dead in his tracks. It was an interesting time, uh, considering I was working somewhere else at the time. Um, but yeah. That's an after trigger. That's basically known as an auditing trigger where a change happens, you log the change in another table and you keep track of what caused it. In other system, it might keep track of who made the change. Um, you know, accounting systems are notorious for this kind of stuff where every single change to any given, uh, to the general ledger is logged somewhere. So we know who, when, and what they did. This is, you know, what an after trigger is for. It's for logging. You could also use it for cleanup purposes. Uh, a before trigger could be used for setting values beforehand. Like, for example, you insert a new user into the database and you need to generate a random key for this user. So that, you know, an API key. And you don't want to trust the, the application program to do it right because, you know, the developers suck knowing how bad my code used to be. I'll admit that. I often wrote stuff right into the database so that I didn't, I knew it was going to be right. And I, if I needed to change the code in the application, it never changed that functionality because the database took care of it. So a before trigger, for example, could uh, create a new key for the person and assign it to the new, to the new data structure before it gets written. You could change the dates. You could actually use the before trigger to detect if something that's not supposed to happen is about to happen and actually raise an error and fail it. Um, when I do the example next week, you'll see an example of that. Um, so this is an example of 
not allowing deletes. So create a trigger before delete on a table called product log for each row, begin. Now, of course, MySQL being MySQL, I can't just go raise error because that would make complete sense as a language. Instead, we set what they call a state, a set a signal SQL state. Signal means, hey, I'm going to tell the connection that something has happened. You're going to tell, oh, an SQL state. SQL state means something happened and it's there's an actual error code coming back. 45,000. Why is it 45,000? MySQL reasons. Everybody else would be just raise error. No, no, no. This guy's SQL state, 45,000. This is the equivalent of MySQL saying, we're done playing now. This command is failing. And then you set a message checks to no, no, and it says no, 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 no deleting the log data. So what this would do is before, so you go delete from log data, it would go, it would literally give you an error message and say, no, 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 you're not allowed to delete this. And then it would just end at that point because you're raising an error. That means the, ins, the, up, the delete statement failed and the SQL interpreter says, oh, this failed. So it tells the client this failed. So a signal SQL state 45,000 is basically saying it, you're done. Um, why is this handy? Well, you don't want to let people delete stuff. You literally tell them they're not allowed to delete stuff. You could use a this kind of a thing also with an insert and update where you're trying to insert some you're trying to insert something and it's not valid for whatever reason. Like um, you're trying to insert something and there's not enough inventory, and the application programmer sucks, and they didn't do an inventory check before they tried to add the order in. You could actually have it say, "Hey, is the inventory available for this order?" No. Raise an error saying, "Hey, we can't insert this row because we don't actually have this." These are some of the uses for triggers. Um, so like I said, next week, I will go and do a complete set of examples. It takes me more than half an hour, which is why it's not happening today. Um, just so you know, the example is actually an inventory system. So when you think about how things get shipped in Amazon from one place to another, or things get shipped to you from a warehouse, I'm actually going to write triggers to actually do the inventory management. It'll be kind of cool. And I'm going to talk about uh, the final exam. So, and uh, as you realize what I just described, you're going to say, what's the week after? I actually don't have any content for the week after. So this is literally, as of today, is the end of the new content. This is it, folks. That This is the end. There is nothing new to be pushed into your heads for this course after today. Yay. Um, we've all had enough content. Now, the lab is a slightly chunkier lab. The one that goes with this uh, lecture topic. Let's go to Brightspace. So I can talk about the lab really quick. Um, it's essentially the same lab we always had for this course, except I combined it in as a single lab. Okay, functions and triggers. Create a function to calculate a customer's balance of all their accounts. Damn it, I did it. That's the example I did. I forgot to read the lab. I gave you guys the answer to the first one. Actually, everybody who's not here is also not gonna watch the video. They're not gonna know. So it's okay. Um, I don't mind giving freebies at this point in the semester. Um, you're going to create a procedure that transfers val uh, a value from one account to the other. So you remember when we talked about transferring money in a bank account where it's multiple steps? In update this one, then update that one. You're going to create a procedure that does the transfer. So you're going to feed it two parameters, the account number or the ID, your choice. I'm giving you guys a choice of how you want to write this. The destination account number or ID, again, your choice. I'd recommend, you know, if you do ID for one, do ID for the other. Don't mix match makes things complicated if you start mix matching. And then the amount to transfer. Now for number three, you're gonna take what you did in number two and add some error checking to it. Make sure there's enough balance for it to run. Raise an error. 
if it fails. You saw the example in the slides how to raise an error. Quit if there's not enough balance because if it can't transfer money, you shouldn't allow them to transfer money. You will submit both triggers. I mean, both procedures. Like I want, don't give me one that does both things. I want what you did originally and then the updated version, just so you know. Create a trigger to log whenever an account balance changes. This should only happen after the account update succeeds. So it's an after update. The log entry should go into a table called account logs. Notice I'm not giving you the table structure. You guys should know how to create a table. Think about what needs to go into this table. Maybe the account ID or the account number, the timestamp, and maybe what the old balance was before the change. So you can just keep track of the changes. Um, create a trigger to stop accounts from being deleted. This should occur before any deletion actually happens, right? So you can't delete a person's bank account. That would be bad. I guarantee in most banking systems, there is definitely a before delete trigger on deleting bank accounts. It is, I don't know if anybody here has ever tried to, okay, there was, most of us have closed an account at some point in our lives. You do realize when you close that bank account, it doesn't actually get deleted, right? It doesn't go away. It just marks it as gone. Why? Because the bank needs to be able to audit. If I remember right in Canada, it's 15 years. They need to keep 15 years worth of transactions so that if they get audited, they can go back 15 years and prove they did nothing bad for 15 years. Therefore, they're not allowed to delete accounts. I guess after 15 years they could, but you know. You're going to create a trigger that if you tried to delete whatever from account, it just says no. There was an example in the slides on how to do it. So that's the lab. That's why this lab is worth a little bit more than the other labs because it's actually a significant amount of work. Apparently less work than I thought it was because I used the wrong frigging example in my exam, my class, but that's okay. Um, you know, you guys get some freebies. Um, you have two weeks. It's due on August 9th. So literally like three, almost three weeks to August 4th. Oh yeah, because the exam is the week after. So yeah, it's due on the 4th. So you got two weeks to do it starting today. Not one. Okay. Yes, that's what it is. It's two weeks, but there's no more because there's no grace period with it. Like it's due on the 4th and no, you don't get to ask for it to be late. That's what that's what the rule was. Now I remember why. I, I, I made a point to remind myself that it was really important I highlight the due date on this because I'll be spending this week finishing off all the grading for this course. And if anybody's particularly late, it's not going to go well for anyone. Um, I may change it. I'll let you guys know next week. I might change it to the ninth just to give you guys a little more wiggle room. Um, you know what? I'll just change it now. There, done. It's due on the ninth. Congrats. You get an extra five days. Um, but yeah, so you're going to just give me a file with all the commands in it. And that's pretty much it for today. It's, uh, yep. Yeah. No, users never see the triggers happen. Well, when ready it errors out. But they don't actually know it's the trigger that fired the error. It just comes back as an error message. And if it's a user using an application, the user rarely will actually see that error message. It's actually going to the developer. Like the, you execute the command in say Python and it gets an error, that execution is going to fail, it's going to return a false, and then you're going to get an error message back as part of the, you know, communications back and forth between Python and the database server. Yeah, if you're working directly on it, they'll get an error message, but they it won't tell them it came from a trigger. It could literally be, it would look as if the update statement's invalid. Triggers happen behind the scenes. They're invisible to the user. Or transparent, I guess we should say, because they don't actually know what's happening. 
There's just a little bit of code that runs at the beginning, a little bit of code runs at the end, and stuff happens. Uh, you need to have the DDL, uh, the DM, DDL, so um, create alter drop. Hey, okay. uh, no data DDL data definition. So not insert update delete because the trigger will use the permissions of whoever's logged in to execute the trigger. So if you're doing an insert, if your user has insert privileges, uh, the before or after triggers will work just fine but they can't change it. It's create, alter, and drop are the ones that you need for, um, yeah. Uh, now in data grip, uh, you can actually see, um, functions and stuff. Maybe cancel, can you? What are you doing? Cancel, cancel. Okay. Um, Pretty sure you can. Routines, there's my, uh, the function. It just, data grip calls it routines. Uh, if I load this in MySQL Workbench, just in case anybody wants to go there, Mac users, you definitely do not want to go there. Just saying. Um, it's pretty horrifyingly bad. Oh, look, there's my example from last semester. It's the last time I loaded MySQL Workbench. Because when I was doing this example last semester. Um, You'll see that they've got um, there. The triggers are actually off the table itself. So um, in here, you see columns, indexes, keys. Um, I wonder if. Hang on, let me go uh, see where that was. That one. Inventory, table, orders. You'll see it, it shows your triggers here. So you'll be able to see the triggers. I just wasn't sure what data grip is going to do. And if you double click on it, you can see your code for your trigger. And all the extra stuff that it would actually add in here, you can see like, you know, definers and all kind of fun stuff. Um, you can. Um, Modify the triggers from here and stuff like that too, so it's good. You can still extract your triggers to figure out what, what's what. So, data grip will do the job for you. Shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> Except for uh, instead of calling them functions, apparently they're called uh, routines. I'm guessing it, it's actually putting uh, functions and store procedures in the same category. Okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice, going three times. <laughs>